Toby. Thanks very much for asking me to be a part of this. It should be a lot of fun. My name is Tom Selinski. I'm a writer, podcaster, corporate coach, and I've picked as my story The Time Warrior, a story I think is the perfect story to show a new Who fan who's never seen the classic series before. It's the first story for Sarah Jane Smith. We get to see the Doctor through her eyes. It's the first story featuring the Santarans. It's the first pseudo-historical, something which is a big feature of the new series, celebrity historicals, but we hadn't seen them in the show before. I think it is a great story. It's one of my favourites. I fell in love with it the very first time I saw it. I'm going to be watching the uh, as broadcast version on the DVD. There's a version with spiffed up special effects. That probably is the version I would show this mythical new fan. But the last time I watched it, I watched that version. So today I'm going to watch the broadcast version instead, which I suspect is what, is what you're going to do. So none of the things I've said are going to be my favourite things. I haven't decided what these are yet. I haven't watched the show again. Uh, so sit back and relax. Enjoy with me, The Time Warrior. Well, welcome back. It is episode two of the Time Warrior. And what I will have just played you as the intro to this episode is the introduction to it from my special guest, who, as you heard, is Tom Selinski. I'm delighted that Tom uh, is doing what no one has done before, is he is watching the episode, as I'm just about to, and then giving his instant reaction to camera into his microphone, depending on whether you're watching or listening. Um, uh, and uh, so we, we get his sort of immediate hot take. So he's doing what, what, what I'm doing, uh, which is really interesting and a bit of a, bit of a, a, a change from what uh, I am used to. So um, we've come hot off the heels of both of our favorite things. Tom and I have chosen the same thing for episode one, which is very exciting because it means that uh, I stand a chance of winning. I've never won at the time of recording this. I have never won this podcast by guessing uh, more of the favourite things of my guest than uh, than than I don't guess. Um, so anyway, let's see if we are in accord for episode two, which is going to start in three, two, one, now. So um, yes, I started talking about the this title sequence, uh, which was a bit of a shock to me uh, in episode one, but that it was over. Because um, I didn't, I had no idea that you saw uh, the whole of John Pertwee, um, uh, which is still a bit of a, 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 a culture shock to me. I expect the Doctor's face in the titles. I don't expect the Doctor's legs. Uh, so, the, and, and, and because these are a sort of halfway house, you know, between the, 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 the famous Pertwee titles and the, the, the definitive Tom Baker titles that use some elements of, of this Burby title sequence. I've never quite settled into it, and it's a shame because it's a, it's a good sequence, um, um, but it's quite, it's quite busy, isn't it? And I know for a lot of people it's, it's a favourite because it's got all the great things of that, that Baker sequence, but, uh, but, but the addition of John Pertwee's legs, which is enough to sell it for some people. I just noticed there, Pertwee give, gives a nod, the Doctor gives a nod as if to say, yes, yes. I, I, I knew it to some tyrant. Um, uh, and, ah, yes, Jeremy Bullock, who I mentioned briefly last episode, um, who at the time of recording has very recently passed away. Uh, I've just, I've just put out my memorial video that I do at the end of every year. I do an in memoriam uh, that takes me all year to put together. Um, uh, so it's always delightful when someone gives it a thumbs down because well, it's not really for me, so I'll wipe the smile off somebody's face who's worked for hours on a thing. Don't start getting... But but really, if, if you don't like a video, just don't do anything. Just just go somewhere you do like. <laughs> uh, I know I'm inviting trouble by doing this, because somebody will go, oh, well, I'll do that now to be funny. Um, it, it, it's terrible, because that cuts deep. <laughs> it, it, it really does. It ruins your day. Um, OK. OK. Um, well done, people who like ruining people's day. Um, anyway, uh, but we've all done it. I've reviewed things. I, I, I actually look back now at things I've reviewed and go, why did I do it? Why was I co so keen to go, oh, I'll point out what's wrong with this. That'll teach that skilled professional who worked for hours on a thing and maybe had to make a compromise because uh, time was short and I've just gone, ah, oh, yeah, but... Um, uh, and actually, it's one of my regrets, actually, I was... 
I was asked to review stuff for Doc 2 magazine and I did and I sort of wish sometimes because I'm you know I'm just a kid who loves Doctor Who being asked to do something for something is so keen um and so for, wow what me right for Doctor Who magazine yeah have my I was right I was writing reviews setting the world to right saying what was wrong with Doctor Who stories for years now I can do it um and I sort of wish I wish I hadn't really uh uh no, because I, I didn't put my opinions. Um, I just, I'm just not sure that the world needed them, and this is what didn't need my opinion of, 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 of uh, you know, what was what was definitely the best program on television at the time, and some of the best Doctor Who at the time. Uh, but you know, if there was a bit I didn't like, I pointed it out, uh, which is another reason to do this and be positive, um, just because I think it's better to bing. I'm, I'm not blind to the fact that the world is a dark place and full of things that aren't very good, but um, I don't know. I think it's better to try and leave leave a positive impression uh, and, and, you know, it's very... Anyway, I've, I've talked all this. Well, I didn't mean to go on a segue. I was talking about Jeremy Bullock. I was talking about Jeremy Bullock and I made a lovely video that took a lot of effort and a lot of heart. Hmm. Um, uh, because Jeremy is one of the many people in 2020 who passed away and I, 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 I went to Jeremy's home he, he did my Who's Round uh, interview and uh, he was he was lovely um, he was a funny chap he was, he's not what you expect because he played Boba Fett I don't know I think Jeremy Bullock is quite a I thought was quite a you know and, he, and, and when you see pictures of him he's you know he's, he's got sort of a bit of a handsome leading man about it so when I saw him in things like this and he was quite light voiced and he had quite sort of sing song. I was like, oh, that's not what I was expecting at all. And he's a lovely man, Jeremy, and very self deprecating, saying he got the part of Boba Fett just because the costume fit. Boba Fett is a. Because Jeremy Bullock played Boba Fett, as well as Hal the Archer in The Time Warrior, and Tor in the Space Museum opposite William Hartnell, with his uh, drama student friends, Peter Saunders and Peter Craze, who are both no longer with us. Peter Craze, Michael Craze's brother, died couple of weeks after as I recall this what three or four days ago he died on New Year's Eve uh, so I have a picture of me sitting in between Peter and Jeremy uh, when we did a thing together uh, Paul Ballard from Phantom Films very kindly sent me the picture and you go crikey they're both no longer with us and both younger than my mum she's terrifying and and, uh, and and Jeremy Bullock is an absolute yeah legend he plays Boba Fett but he was very very self-deprecating about why he got the part because he fitted the costume but there's something about Boba Fett he has you know he has bucket loads of uh inscrutability inscrutability inscrutableness uh and he's just a simmering presence and I know the costume's good but there's there's a certain indefinable magic that Jeremy Bullock brings to it I don't I I don't think any actor could have done that um and I like the fact that, therefore, the Jeremy Bullock Boba Fett is in Doctor Who as well. And I went to Jeremy Bullock's house and he, has a, he had a Boba Fett room in his house. He took me up after we'd done the interview where he revealed that when he wasn't working, he did lots of painting and decorating. Uh, and it was quite funny because he, he went to, like I sort of went on on a slightly Alan Partridge-y uh, uh, a segue there, Dad. I went down Partridge Avenue um, with my, oh, yeah, yeah, people putting the thumbs down. Um, you know, it's the, it's the worst thing you can do is to take issue with a critic because it makes you sound petty. Uh, and it makes, uh, and, it, and it makes it look like it's got to you. And that is, that, that is the victory for them. Shut up, Toby. I will. Um, and, uh, did, but Jeremy was talking about painting and decorating, and he suddenly he did. He, he he went down Partridge Avenue by sort of go. And oh, then sometimes people, you know, these women would say, this woman would say, oh, and you haven't done that skirting board properly. Oh well, madam, I think it's fine that you brought your dog back in from the walk and you hadn't dried him, and then you let him go up against the skirting board, and he got quite sort of sort of pernickety. And I'm suddenly going, Boba Fett is being a bit, a bit, a bit. As, a bit of, like a bit of a sort of a bit of partridgey about but about his painting and decorating business because he's a very skilled painter and decorator you know that was it because we were talking about what he did 
you know, when he wasn't acting, I thought he might say, oh, I'll help the mate in a shop. But he actually was, was a skilled and, and took his painting and decorating very seriously and got annoyed with customers who were twats <laughs> and remembered them 20 years later. Uh, all things that I would do. <laughs> I wouldn't remember any of the houses that went well. I'd remember the woman who annoyed me because she didn't dry her dog from the walk and then blamed my, the skirting boards on me. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, after that, uh, dear Jeremy, there he is, uh, took me up to his Boba Fett room where he had every piece of Boba Fett merchandise available from a full-size Boba Fett to a Boba Fett electric guitar, Boba Fett watch, a, a female Boba Fett. Um, and, uh, and here he is about to get his head chopped off uh, uh, by John J. and Steve Brunswick again, you can tell. Steve Brunswick's the one with the sort of fur shoulders. Uh, he will peak. We will get peak Brunswick in episode three. Um, but he looks good, Jeremy uh, uh, Bullock. He looks like Robin Hood, doesn't he? And he's in Robin of Sherwood as Edward of Wickham. Uh, so, you know, he was he was around. He was always, he was part... He was part of the furniture. But as I say, I was quite surprised when I got to this to find that sort of sing-song lilt that he has. Much to higher register than I than I thought. Um, but he totally looks the part. You'd have him as Robin Hood, wouldn't you, Jeremy? Uh, and he was... And because he's quite self-deprecating, he's much funnier than he would give himself credit for. I think But behind that... Oh, well, I was just wearing the costume. He's, he was an utter gentleman. He was funny. Um, he was also funny when he was talking about painting and decorating when he did when he didn't mean to be funny. But that's okay, and I'm not being mean when I say that. I, you know, I, I'm I will point out my own folly equally quickly. But he did abuse me. It stuck with me. The fact that. I, but, but, but anyway, so I'm not. I'm not pleased. I, I, I'm speaking with love. Uh, he's a. He's a. He's. A, he was very. Very decent with his time, picked me up from the station, uh, allowed me into his home, his beautiful home, his lovely wife too, um, talked so lovingly of his grandchildren as well. So, un, you know, nothing about his career bothered him at, at all. He was, he was really happy to talk about it, but because some actors would, you know, some actors having played Boba Fett would go, yeah, well, uh, you know, um, the thing about Boba Fett was that, uh, uh, you know, it was my idea to do this. Sort of, he just went, well, look, Bob, Boba Fett's amazing and, and an icon and it's not really much to do with me. I was, it was just, it was just, and you go, no, uh, you know, a lot of people big up their parts. I think Jeremy, if anything, underplayed his role. And, and, and I, but I don't think it was false modesty either because you can spot that a mile off. I just think he genuinely, he liked acting. He did loads of really interesting stuff, but he loved his grandchildren and he was... He just, I really liked him, and I'm, 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 oh, you know, I'm sad that, uh, that, uh, the weavers of my childhood dreams, uh, are, are dwindling. Uh, but I'm also extremely lucky to have spent quality time with them. I'm not talking much about the Time Warrior, I'm sorry. Uh, it's my birth, it's my party, and I'll segue if I want to. <laughs> I, I, I love. The fact that Lynx thinks Iron Gron's a dick. <laughs> and I love the fact that Iron Gron just smashes his way through everywhere. Oh, and this is where he sees his face for the first time. And and, and the and the and the bit above his nose, the, the sort of little cross, it's such a brilliant design. Um <laughs> I love the way because Iron Gron calls him toad face, doesn't he? I love that. Um but that the articulation, the mouth in that costume, and the fact that you can see that, and, and, and it's funny, I never had this one on VHS, because it was one of the ones edited together, wasn't it? And my copy of this, which was, uh, I think must have been a very, you know, second generation from an Australian airing, because I had an excellent quality copy of this uh, on a Scotch tape. But if, it was, but if you, 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 Scotch tapes were the ones that, that lasted, but they were really expensive. I had the Time Warrior one to four, and Seeds of Doom one to three, on one tape, did I? Or did I have Claws of Axos, Seeds of Doom 1 to 3, Seeds of Doom 4 to 6, Time Warrior? Do you know what, I can't remember, and I would have known I would have been able to, I don't, but it was definitely a Scotch, I think that was it, I think that's what I had. I think I'd asked for a Pertwee, and then Seeds of Doom on a separate tape, and the guy who'd done them had, had, had mixed them up, and I was never quite happy that 
Tom Baker was stuck in between two John Pertwee's. It didn't didn't feel right. I think I'd maybe wanted Frontier in Space in the middle, uh, and, that, and that actually came on a separate tape. Uh, that probably, probably bothered me far more than it should have done. Look at that. That's a Doc 2 image. The doc, there's a scientist in a medieval castle in his pyjamas doing hypnotised science. Uh, Doctor Who d does incongruity beguilingly and brilliantly better than anything else. It's the Yeti on the loo in Tooting Beck. It's the, it's the pyjama scientist in a medieval castle with computer banks. I love that. Uh, it, 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 uh, and, and here comes Professor Rubish, uh, who can't see, which is probably good for when it comes to read the closing credits and finds he's, he's tumbled to the bottom of them. Uh, he's, uh, he's got, I think, I think that's, he's bald now, Don Palmier, but I, I think, is that a wig? I think it must be. Um, uh, so I haven't I haven't actually talked about the episode much, so um, I, I, sh I shouldn't be stumbling here because there's plenty to discuss. Oh, Tom, Tom Selinsky, by the way, who's who's doing this, I think, so brilliantly. Um, it's, it, 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 I, I, when I say with this thing, you know, I'm, I, I'm asking a friends of mine. To, Tom did a quiz on Outpost Gallifrey on a forum um, and, and uh, named a number of things, and it was like you had to do pointless. You had to you had to name one that the fewest people would name, I think. And, and I think my, my real joker to play was when he said, name a member of unit, and I, uh, but not an extra. And I mentioned Private Upton, who is not credited in Doctor of the Silurians because he's played by Simon Kane, who plays a Silurian, but he does have lines, so he's a, he's a character. And I explained that in my answer. Um, and anyway, and I won this thing. I won this quiz. It's the only thing I've ever won. I think I'd outpost Gallifrey. And this is before I'd done Moth Sake My Doctor Who Scarf or anything like that. Uh, and then I was doing Moth Sake My Doctor Who Scarf in Edinburgh. And this bloke was doing a show nearby, I think. Or we, we certainly, yes. Oh, because his wife was doing the show after mine, I think, or before mine. She's a fine uh, comic and broadcaster, Deborah Francis White. And, um, and he said, oh, I'm Tom Selinsky. And I'm like, you're kidding. And we'd, we'd literally done this thing not long before beforehand. So we met then. And uh, and it's it's amazing how huh? you know you meet you come across each other online and then fate fate throws fate has thrown many a Doctor Who connection in my way. Not least June Brown Dot Cotton, who actually had my copy of the Time Warrior that Scotch tape, which I put in, into a into a proper box because my friend had got a video store and he'd got some spare boxes, a grey snapshot plastic box because I was uh, a spear carrier in a play at Ludlow Castle with an actor called Robert Arnold. Uh, it was in, it was in As You Like It with Touchstone played by Sylvester McCoy. Uh, it was no, no, but it was, it was, it was the Scottish play. Bob came back the following year to Ludlow. It was the Scottish play, David Rintoul, Hayden Gwynn, and Ross was played by Robert Arnold, who was married to June Brown. So I lent him my copy of the Time Warrior and didn't get and, and he sent it back to me a year later, just before coming to Ludlow again. So we did actually work with each other again. So he could have carried it, but he, he, he I think he felt guilty, thought I can't go back to Ludlow till I send that lad his Doctor Who uh video back. Uh and and as a reward, bless her, June Brown um got uh, uh Sharon, uh Nick Cotton and Pete Beale to sign photos for me. So I've got signed photos of those. Pete Beale, of course, was an extra in The Face of Evil, which I didn't know at the time. So that's a Doctor Who person. Uh, so I've got signed photos of all those, and she signed hers dot, and they put lots of dots on the picture. Um, so she actually, my video copy of the time, which I still have in the attic upstairs, was actually at Dot Cotton, Lady Eleanor's house, for, for nearly a year. Uh, Bob Arnold, sadly, is, is, uh, is no longer with us. Uh, he was Robert Arnold, the actor. He's in the Countdown episode of Blake Seven. He's not Bob Arnold, who was in The Archers. They're two different actors. Uh, but the Bob I knew acted as Robert Arnold. Um, uh, and we have to mention Jacqueline Stanbury, who doesn't make the credits at all, who was a maid Mary in episode one. And, they, and episode one was overrunning, so they cut, they cut the one scene that she was in. Uh, I don't know anything about her other than the fact that she was nearly in Doctor Who and then wasn't. Um, 
or they cut her lines anyway. Um, uh, I think Lynx is such a convincing creature. He stands in quite a sexy way. Um, I don't know, and I'm, I'm a t totally heterosexual man, but I think there's something about the way that Lynx holds himself that's quite, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the one leg forward and one leg slightly back. Um, and maybe it's the maybe it's the leather costume. Maybe that's it. So it says says me in my I'm wearing my birthday shirt and a rather garish kerchief. I was given many, and I will learn to love them all. Um, <laughs> he's got hairy ears. He's got Dennis Healy's eyebrows. I love that because they're real and they don't draw attention to themselves. The designer's not going, oh look at this. The designer is augmenting it with with clever little touches. And I believe the skin, I believe that that is skin. And they are the, the mouth, you get a performance and it's a brilliant performance. And he invests the creature with a real personality. And he's got, I talked about this when we did Sontaran Experiment, he's got, he's an Australian who's doing RP and it, so it means it's a slightly compromised diction. Um, my ship's frequency. So it, it, yeah, it's, which makes it, unique um because it's this weird synthesis of the two um and it's a neat idea isn't it um i mean it's it's weird i don't quite buy the idea that um uh, you, you haven't got enough you you haven't, you're not quite equipped to take off but you are equipped to travel or at least or at least yeah to travel forward in time with enough solidity to be able to steal some, snatch some scientists. It, 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 it seems to me if you have that technology that this, that this, this plan is sort of unnecessary, but it, 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 but I don't care. I don't care. I only say that just because I, I, I otherwise I'd talk about John Pertwee's green jacket. Um, uh, I, I, it, it doesn't. It doesn't bother me that that that, that, that the plot doesn't quite hang for me in a way, because what it gives us is this wonderful um, uh, uh, sort of parallel storyline of 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 Lynx arming these two idiots and their stupid men. Um, with gradually more advanced weapons. So that's quite a wheeze for the story. That is quite a wheeze. You have the, you know, you have the robot knight um, whose arms are clearly coming out of his sides, not his shoulders because he's, you know, he's tall, that's clever. Um, uh, and, and, and now he's giving them, you know, guns and, 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 and the sort of fascination that, that Lynx has with this sort of little war game that he plays that he doesn't do with any sort of glee, which I like. Um, some, you know, sometimes villains can enjoy themselves too much. To him, it's 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 a you know it's a sort of it's a it's a diversion. He's not he, he's not particularly enjoying himself. Um, uh, but he said, does say he says it would amuse me to think of Ivo. But he's not he's not a cackling villain. Uh, he's he's a terse, functional guy trying to do a thing, and while he's doing it, you know has this sideline in, in arming thickos. <laughs> yeah, tomorrow, yeah, you'll be feeding the crows. Yeah. Feeding the crows, yes. I, remember. I always worried about things like that, uh, the fact that behind Sarah and Hal, you know, it's obviously, you know, white studio backdrop because, you know, they can't put the sky in or whatever, you know, you a, a background in. But um, it was televisual grammar. You, you knew what they were driving at and you accepted it. Um, oh, you know, I'll, I'll be saying that sort of thing till I blew in the face. So it's almost totally redundant. <laughs> so, yeah, thanks for listening to that, that thing that I've just said that I then immediately followed up by saying it's pointless. Um, oh, that's the other thing is, of course, this is January the 2nd. I mean, it doesn't really count as January the 2nd anymore when I'm recording this. So yesterday we found out that John Bishop, who I've known for about 20 years and gigged with for 20 years, uh, is now part of 
Doctor Who's rich history. It's really weird now watching the show where, you know, people I've rubbed shoulders with, people I know. I mean, he, he texted me afterwards when I texted him. Um, you know, now part of this thing that, uh, you know, for all my involvement with, I've never, I've never, you know, I've never actually been, been in. Uh, so it's 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 a, it's a strange and uh, bittersweet experience. Uh, I'm delighted for John. He's a top fella uh, and one of the best comedians I've ever worked with. He's such a good comic, and he's a you know an earthy and very natural actor, which I like, which I think Doctor Who needs in its uh, in its companion figures because they they ground the drama. Um, and we've got a new companion in this. That's is that. That's clearly not John Pertwee in this rather nice long shot that uh, 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 director Alan Bromley, who again I haven't mentioned, <laughs> and the episode has finished. Poor old director Alan Bromley. Um, oh gosh, I, I didn't talk about the episode then much, but I have to just, I have to just trust my instincts, don't I, and just go with uh, with whatever's on my mind. I, oh, I went up Partridge Avenue. That's right. <laughs> Uh, Hal, Jeremy Bullock, Anna June Brown. Gosh, she's she's she must be in her nineties now, mustn't she? Is she? Oh, as is Donald Palmier. So uh, Mark Boyle, Kronos himself is the fighter ranger. And yes, Peckforton Castle, uh, just up the road, is a it's been a great location. I like all these. Everyone gets a single credit, a single caption credit. Alan Bromley, I must tell you about him next week. Uh, so, but in talking about that and getting slightly distracted, uh, uh, and having played my, I've got to now try and pause the episode three. Um, having played my Lynx Joker, I think much of what I talked about then was uh, Lynx. Um, so what in that well i mean it's it's going to be a bit boring isn't it but i think it's going to i think it's going to have to you know am i just going to do the characters um but i i, I mean i love iron gron and bloodax um i i i loved iron gron's reaction to to um seeing licks his face so you also fair across to us have we had that, have we had the line where I, because of course I talk through it, I have to, which means it's very difficult for me to sometimes, you know, pick up on everything. Um, I know uh, uh, Iron Gron has that lovely line where he describes the Doctor as a long-shanked rascal with a mighty nose. <laughs> which Terence Dix always said that people quoted him as being a brilliant, typical Robert Holmes line, but Terence said it was actually one of his. And uh, that wouldn't surprise me because Terence is a much funnier writer than he's given credit for. Um, and we always know him as the genius script editor and we know Robert Holmes is capable of the, the most brilliant and funny lines, but Terence is funny too. Um, uh, anyway, um, I took my eye off the ball there slightly. Um, but... Oh, scientists in pyjamas in a castle. No, I think I'm going to go for... Because I think sometimes I, you know, choose a tiny thing like a prop and then and forget to mention a really brilliant character. So I'm going to, uh, with the promise of looking out for more next week rather than saying which members of the cast I lent things to <laughs> or whose house I've been to, uh, I'm going to choose two characters, the actors of whom I've never met and whose houses I've never been to, but Bloodaxe and Iron Gron, uh, I think, are super duper. Uh, I think they're brilliant characters. I think they're a great double act. I think they're very funny, but they're also plausible threats. And they're judged perfectly because they're stupid, but, you, but never to the point where you don't take them seriously as protagonists and as, as a danger to the Doctor. So Iron Gron and Bloodaxe, because I love them and uh, I would have chosen them for, 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 for one of the episodes. So I'm going to choose them for this one. I'm not sure Tom's going to have chosen them for this one. Just, no, let's see what he's chosen. I may have squandered my lead. And episode two doesn't disappoint either. 
it's all just fantastic, isn't it? I mean, maybe the robot's a little bit <laughs> embarrassing. Uh, it looks very good with its head cut off, though, I've got to say. I'm not absolutely sure that that would be a deal breaker for a New Who fan. It's about the only thing which is coming close to it. Um, I think what I admire most about this episode is just how well plotted it all is. The business with Rubish's glasses is brilliant, means that he can be an active force, and it's all been carefully seeded in from episode one. Uh, and then we have the situation where the Doctor is apparently being held prisoner and is subdued. At the same time, Sarah Jane Smith, who's only just met him, suspects that he is the bad guy, and now the raid on the castle is going to unwittingly bring the Doctor back into the fold as a force for good again. It's really brilliantly constructed. There's so much else here going on to enjoy that great high-angle shot of the fight at the end, making it probably not obvious that that wasn't John Pertwee, but uh, it's yeah, I think it's I think it's the plotting. Holmes's plotting is just fantastic here, absolutely brilliant. Yeah, I'll take that. That was good. I, and, and yes, I'd forgotten. Funny enough, I nearly said I'm not a great fan of the robot because I'm not a great fan of the robot. Um, and I wish I had now because it shows that Tom and I are still very much in accord. It is, it is the one, I think, weak point for me. And I think it's because his arms are clearly coming out of his sides and they built his shoulder up. That means that they can chop his head off. It's actually uh, an efficient uh, and, and smart piece of costuming to pull off the, you know, the trick of chopping his head off. Anyway, it just does flap about a bit. Um, I mean, move, yeah. Anyway, this is the accentuate the positive thing. I just thought it was interesting that the the one thing I'd have put as a as a chink in uh, uh, the armor of uh, the Time Warrior is the is the the guy in armor. Um, but I'll take the plotting. And I forgot. Yes, the thing where Sarah actually, yeah, it is a nice wheeze that Sarah thinks the Doctor's up to no good. And yeah, the whole the whole thing they're doing now is they're not rescuing him. They've come to capture him because they think he's a baddie, which is a brilliant sort of almost farcical thing. But I didn't choose that. I chose Iron Gron and Blood Axe. So it's one all uh, to me and Tom. Uh, and I'm gonna. I'm getting tired, but I can't miss the opportunity to. Um, uh, yeah, to, 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 to watch episode three tonight. You won't get it. It makes no difference to you. You will get that on the next episode. So uh, uh, for now, thanks very much. But do join me when I release the next episode, which is the last episode of Doctor Who to be broadcast before I was born. So there's a thing. Uh, I'll see you next time. Ta-ta. Okay.